Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mount Vernon. Take a moment now, turn around and greet one another with the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ. Nice to have everyone with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. Several announcements to bring to your attention. First, um, for all of you who have been part of the Lenten small groups, this coming Wednesday night, um, the hospitality of the Garens has been poured out on all of us. All of our groups are going to be meeting together. So the Wednesday 11 o'clock group from the library and all of the other three small groups will be meeting at the Garens. Hopefully you'll get that information. Are the Garens here? If you are able to bring dessert, just give, um, just give Chris a call, let her know that. But they're going to have refreshments for us, and it'll be a wonderful way to kind of pull everything together at the end of this um, small group series. So be aware of that. You will also find in your bulletin this morning some information on One Great Hour of Sharing. We'll have a minute for mission telling you a little bit more about that next week. Um, but the offering does begin. It takes place throughout the season of Lent, it is a, one of the four large offerings of our denomination, and all of the income from this goes to disaster relief, hunger assistance, and self-development of people. So it's all mission um, priorities of the church. So feel free to, uh, to learn more about it through the insert in your bulletin, and you can make a, an offering in the, using those envelopes anytime over the next couple of weeks. Is Janice here? Janice is probably still running around with kids. Anybody who worked yesterday to help make our egg hunt a success, thank you all so much. We had um, close to 40 kids here and their families, and it was a wonderful day. They made all kinds of um, health kits that are going to be sent overseas in needy parts of the world. So um, just thanks to everybody who helped make that a go yesterday. Are there any other? We have one more important one. Any other? Not, oh, yes. Uh, you want to talk about it? Go ahead. Any other announcements this morning? Before one more really important one? Okay. Um, we have a very, very special announcement this morning, and it's going to be brought to us by Libby Morrison, a presentation that needs to be made. It is. Okay. The Presbyterian women have wanted to honor one of our most distinguished women and are very pleased to have this opportunity to do so today. This woman was well known for many things that she has done for this church and the community around us. She was an elder in the class of 2010. She worked with preschoolers for summer Bible school the first year she became a member of our church. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work with her then. And I was really impressed with her ability to work with young people. She just kept their attention. Maybe that is why she took on so many key roles in leading and providing indispensable assistance to the Advent event and the Easter egg hunts. Even though she had earned a Master of Divinity degree in theological studies at Alexandria Episcopal Seminary, she took the disciple program along with the rest of us 
and added greatly to the knowledge we gained from our studies. She has always been interested in Christian education and served as director of Christian education at Calvary, Heritage, as well as Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. She helped inaugurate the program Children in Worship, frequently leading it through its first several years. She supervised the nursery on Sunday mornings, often helping there in arranging coverage of staff for special events at the church. She was a point person for children's ministry at Mount Vernon Presbyterian, organizing Sunday school activities for the past two years. From preschool, she frequently co-taught that, middle grades, the tweens, and, co and recruiting for junior and senior high teachers as well. She was director of Ingalls wi Eagle Wings, tutoring at Calvary Presbyterian Church for four years from 2002 to 2006. This program brought together tutors from many churches in the area and helped scores of Mount Eagle Elementary School students over the years. She works in all aspects of our Agape program by teaching, driving, working in the kitchen, assisting in personal counseling, and assistance to its consumers on many occasions. She aided the Presbyterian women by being our spiritual nurture communicator for several years. She volunteered and set up the Advent dinner programs where she conducted plays with many of our talented youth and adults. She has long been our go-to person for installing our officers, and she's put together our Women's Sunday service for many, on many occasions, including giving the term sermon, doing the time with children, and finding all of the women needed to participate. She was always willing to pitch in and lend a hand in any special event, including setting and cleaning up for Wednesday Night Live and other gatherings involving Presbyterian women. An honorary life membership in Presbyterian women honors an individual's faithful service to some area of church work, and our recipient has contributed in many areas. We proudly choose Dot Heil to honor today. Dot, would you stand up? Just so we know. <laughs> Friends, now I invite you to come as a community of faith and let us together worship God.
us pray. Dear God, thanks for our church members and all who come here to worship. Thanks for the people here who do things unnoticed. May we also not forget among ourselves those who are hurting and healing. We are told not to forget to entertain strangers as we may be entertaining angels unaware. But the times those strangers are just regular folks, may we do something great for them. But what is a great thing? Free concert tickets, a free dinner, a present of sorts. You tell us to bear fruit, fruit of the Holy Spirit that we now have as believers in Jesus Christ. Your gift to us, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. May we bring gentleness to the torn, peace to the distressed, love to the lonely. This is my prayer for our church's people. We do great things for others, but let's keep each other in mind often. Thanks for crying babies and messy rooms. Thanks for pink and thanks for blue. Cold breezes are becoming warm and gentle. The air feels good. March madness is fine, but I'll take March gladness. Let's bear fruit and bring gladness into the world, one person, one conversation at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture reading today is from Psalm 138. In the middle of your Bible, after Psalm 137. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
this time I'd like to invite the boys and girls to come on down front and join me for the children's sermon, please. Come on down, guys. Have a seat. How many of you um, were at the Easter egg hunt yesterday? I think all of you were, weren't you? Were, all, were most of you guys there? Well, this morning, I was walking over to Sunday school, and look what I found. You got a red one? I think this is actually the one that Harry threw up into one of the trees, and it must have fallen down because it was laying right under that big uh, cedar tree off to the side. It might have been yours. Is that way of your saying that maybe I should give it to you before you leave? <laughs> well, it was left behind, and so guess who gets it now? Me. That's right. <laughs> have you ever felt, have you ever been left behind anywhere? Have you ever, like, been maybe out shopping somewhere and your parents kind of accidentally left without you? <laughs> In a dream? That would be a nightmare, wouldn't it, Brielle? That would be kind of scary. When, 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 my, when my children were little, you know where we left them behind? At church. <laughs> Both me and Miss Shan, we took separate cars to church, and so she thought I had them, and I thought she had them, and we left them behind back at the church. And it wasn't until when somebody, so somebody called us that we knew we needed to go pick them up. <laughs> Do you think, do you think God ever leaves anyone behind? He doesn't. He never does. He never, ever does. And we're in this season getting ready for Easter, and there's all kinds of stories that we tell around Easter, and one of them is about Jesus going into a garden and praying and actually saying to God, God, why have you let me down? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you left me behind? And what he discovers is that God doesn't leave anyone ever behind. He didn't leave Jesus behind, and he doesn't leave any of us ever behind. He never forgets us. He's always with us, and he's always a, just a breath away. So. Think about that. When you are fearful, when you're afraid, when you're lonely, when you feel like you don't have any friends, just remember you're not alone. God is always there. He's always with you. Okay? Let's pray, and then you guys can go back to your seats, all right? God, thank you for, uh, for never leaving us behind. Thank you for always being near to us. And thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, and everybody said Amen. Okay, thanks. You guys go back to your seat.
Today's second reading comes to us again from the Gospel of Mark, today from the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 14. Listen, as always, for what the Spirit might have to say to you. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered, you say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked them again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. <clears throat> now at the feast, at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Friends, the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful, thanks be to God. You all hate me, don't you? For some reason, you blame me, don't you? You think it was my fault that I'm the one who is somehow responsible for Jesus' death. This morning, I'm here to change that. This morning, I am here to let you know that when Pilate asked the people who should be released, I was as surprised as anyone. When that crowd started shouting my name, Barabbas, Barabbas, I was as surprised as anyone. Your scripture tells you that releasing a prisoner was like a common practice. But I had never heard of it before. I knew of no such tradition. Frankly, I think it was just a way for the Roman authorities to try and win a little bit of my affection. They were really afraid of Jesus. So the more allies they had, the better. That whole sham of letting one of us go, it stunned me. And then, then when the crowd made the decision that they did, it surprised me too. So don't blame me. You can't blame me. Rome, all the religious leaders who sympathized with Rome, particularly the Sadducees, the other well-off religious leaders living high off the hog, the ones whose wealth and power was guarded by Rome, they were the ones who made the decision that that wonderfully awful decision. Wonderful because it saved my life. Awful. So awful because, well, it took his. It had been a crazy week. All of Judea was up in arms. There were all kinds of visitors to the city for Passover celebrations, and tensions were already 
at a high. They always were whenever Rome and the Jews got too close. Five days earlier, on Sunday, there was a group hailing Jesus with palm branches, proclaiming him king of the Jews. But now, on Friday, today there was another group, most likely a group assembled by the Roman authorities, the high priests, and this new group, this new group of people, they wanted Jesus dead. They were the ones laying plans already for his crucifixion. So it wasn't my fault. You cannot blame me. If you're going to blame anyone, if you need to blame someone, blame Rome. Jesus Jesus just made them nervous. And whenever Rome was nervous, the people were nervous. And the nervousness, well, it was all about threats to Roman power. That's why they didn't like me. I challenged them all the time. But on this day, on this day, they discovered that they had more cause to be nervous about Jesus. He was a far greater threat than me. And they finally discovered that. You see, in the grand scheme of things, guys like me, they were a dime a dozen. And what were a few band of rebels like me with knives and swords going to do against the Roman army? Come on, let's be honest. They had nothing to fear when it came to people like me they were far more powerful, and we knew that. All we could hope to do was take out a few soldiers every now and then. We were no match for the powers before us, and we knew that. But Jesus, this guy Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth, he was another story. He had a completely different approach to the situation. And that approach, his approach, it, it just made Rome nervous. You see, most of you think that he was upset with the Jews, with the way his religion and his people had been corrupted. And, and don't get me wrong, he was. He hated the way people's relationship and walk with God had become so institutionalized that it had lost power. He didn't see a whole lot of love and grace and peace, and he was particularly furious at the way his people caved in to the culture around them, perverting the law, perpetuating injustice. So he had his issues with the Jews. But don't be fooled. His concern went so far beyond Jewish law and practices. The real hypocrisy of the day was that people continued to practice what they thought was their right, their true religion, when in fact, when in fact, if you dug just a little bit, you would see that their worship was of the empire. And their God was the emperor. You see, it's one thing to be ignorant of the things of God and then to devote ourselves to, to someone or something else. But it's yet another thing to pretend to be a faithful person, a pious person, a religious person, to pretend you really know and love and serve God when in fact you are really worshiping and serving something totally different. That's, that's what really had Jesus so angry, so upset. The very place where peace and justice were to be preached had become, well, they had become an advocate for the corrupt and abusive status quo. And that's what Jesus was rebelling against. That's what he was challenging. 
And that's what's, what made the authorities so afraid, so very afraid. You see, and I would only learn this later in my life, Jesus threatened their power in ways I had never seen before. I, Barabbas, I was a rebel, yes, no doubt about that. The politics of the empire disgusted me. The way they trampled on the poor and made it impossible for people to ever get ahead. There were two kinds of people in the Roman Empire, those with power and those who were denied power. I was in the latter group. I was the one who was held back, not, not in obvious ways, not in overt ways, but subtly, through, through systemic sin, if you will, that stacked the deck against people like me. We wanted to, to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. That was our call. But in reality, it, it was just impossible for us to do. So, so, yeah, I rebelled. And I rebelled the only way I knew how, violently. I killed people. Not because I'm such a bad person, but because that seemed like the only way I could speak out. The only way I could let the system know that something needed to change. That was the only way I knew. Address violence with more violence. But that was not the case with this Jesus guy. Not at all. In the weeks and months after my release, I discovered that he felt much the same way that I did. He knew how broken the structures of our society were, how corrupt this system of domination and control had become. But what made him a much greater threat to Rome was that unlike me, he never allowed his, his passion to get out of control. He didn't go running around killing people, thereby adding to the chaos, the sinfulness of the day. Rather, Jesus, he spoke of another way, a better way, a different way, a way of challenging, chastising, and changing the system without violence. That's not how he fought injustice. Rather, he used this, this kind of quiet form of protest and rage even. Love was his greatest weapon. And his agenda, his agenda was always more, more transformational than, than political. It wasn't that he didn't care about the politics of Rome, because he did. But he knew that the government was only going to, going to change when the hearts of the people being governed changed. And so in word and deed, strong and powerful, Jesus offered another way, a better way, a, a second way a way seasoned with grace and peace, a way that Rome was unable to challenge with sword and nail. And that's what scared them. They were not interested in having that kind of rabble-rouser in such a problem-laden part of the empire. And so that's why they set things up the way they did. That's why an innocent man died a violent death at the hands of the very people he had come to love and to serve. So no, don't blame me. This was Rome's doing. I already feel guilty enough. I know that what I did was wrong, but Jesus, Jesus was so different. And Rome didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. So that Friday morning, when they brought me and Jesus out before the crowd, can you picture it in your mind's eye? 
At that moment, it wasn't so much about me as it was about Jesus. They wanted him out of the picture. They wanted him dead. When that crowd started shouting, my name, I knew that their shouts really weren't shouts of affection for me as much as they were shouts of hate and resentment and fear directed toward that one standing beside me. He looked like a lamb, truly, being sled, being led to the slaughter, not afraid, so much as just kind of sad. And not once did he defend himself. He didn't deny the charges that were brought against him. He never raised a fist or blocked a blow. There was just this quiet inner strength that defied their abuse and refused to give them any more power than they already had. From all that I learned from Mark, Jesus only spoke once during the entire trial, and he wasn't angry or bitter or even really sarcastic. He displayed great strength, great power, great security. And when he refused to dignify all of their charges and accusations, when he remained silent in the face of those who held his future in their hands, he displayed just a courageous form of contempt that was contagious. So one last time, don't blame me for what happened. No one thought their life would be any different because of anything I could do. They knew. They knew that only Jesus could do that. They knew that he was the only one on the platform that could change lives. That he was the only one who could really challenge empires, not me. And they thought that crucifying him would put an end to all of it. But you know what? The world did change. In spite of his death. Or maybe because of his death. The world changed. If I had only known then what I know today, maybe I would have said something. Maybe not. But I am a different person now. You see, I don't know how you can go through an experience like that and not be changed. When they let me go, I ran as fast as I could. I can remember finding my family, all the hugs that we exchanged. We went home, we had lunch together. We talked about how we couldn't believe that I was actually free. I clearly remember sitting at the table and taking a piece of bread and suddenly hearing in the distance the sound of a cracking whip. My heart started pounding. I took a gulp of wine and heard laughter in the distance. How could this be happening? I remember thinking. This guy hadn't done anything wrong, and yet they were crucifying him. He was willing to give it all up, even his very life, for the sake of this love that he was always talking about. How could you not want to find out about a person like that? I had to, and that's what I did. Several days later, I met some people who knew him. I met this prostitute, or former prostitute, I should say, who told me how Jesus had saved her from being stoned by an angry crowd. She was so moved by that experience that well, as I said, she's now a former prostitute. Her life was changed. And then I met this guy named Bartimaeus who said that Jesus gave him new eyes to see the world differently. He, too, said that his life had been changed. 
And then I met a whole bunch of guys who hung, hung around with Jesus on, on a regular basis. I had heard about them. They were supposedly Jesus' closest friends who knew him really well. And they told me stories that I will never forget. Stories about calming the storms of their lives. Helping them to live in a light that could brighten even the darkest of their days. They were so sure of themselves. And they stuck together like glue. Jesus had been their leader. And yet, even though he was gone, they were still following him. They were convinced. They were convinced that as long as people were willing to do that, stick together and follow Jesus, to take the path that he offered them, they knew that if they did that, he would never really be gone. One night they invited me to have dinner with him. And that's when my life changed. We got talking about how the sins of the day had ultimately led to Jesus' death and how that happens all the time. They helped me understand how violence and injustice kill God in every day and in every age. And how the real message of Jesus' life was that we need to resist that. And we need to try to change that. The sins of the world kill Christ all the time. And so the choice now is ours. Actually, it's yours. Will you just walk away from this story feeling badly for the poor innocent one who died on a cross at the hands of Rome? Or will you put aside your jelly beans and your chocolate bunnies long enough to consider what following him really requires. That's the choice I eventually had to make. It's a choice we all have to make. His death, his death changed your world. Has it changed your life? Only you can answer that. Let us pray. God, this Lenten journey we've been on have taken us through important events that took place during the last week of Jesus' life. That week changed the world. May it continue to change us. For your sake. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers forward to receive our offering.
Well, before we leave today, we're going to spend our final few minutes together in prayer, and um, I'm going to get us started by saying, you know, when we are a family, and whenever somebody leaves, there's always a hole. Um, but if we're honest, some people leave bigger holes than others. <laughs> and um, Dot and Al's departure is leaving a gaping hole, not just in our life as a church, but in our hearts. And so um, we just there are no words. We're going to have an opportunity to be with them during the fellowship hour. I invite you all to come over there and enjoy some times with them, but just know that you are loved, that you will be dearly missed here, and that you will always have friends at Mount Vernon Prez that are praying for you. So, and we hope we were going to see you. You're not, you're not dying. You're just moving an hour or so away. So we expect to be in touch, but know that we're going to be praying for you. Yeah, Al, go ahead. And more than that, we realized that it was what somebody called an outreach church. It looked beyond itself to help other souls. Kind of reminds me of the cartoon that Dot spotted for me yesterday. The cartoon was about kids who said to their old grandfather, uh, you count sheep and you go to bed. No, I speak to the shepherd. And that's what this church means to us. The finest congregational family that we have been privileged to associate ourselves with and get this 55 years together. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Joys, concerns that you'd like to lift up this morning? Yeah, Oren? Oh. Cousin, did you say? Oren's cousin in Nebraska who had a stroke and passed away this past week. We will remember you and uh, the entire family. Yeah, Jack. Your sister broke her foot. We will remember your sister this morning. The people of Vanuatu, whose land and homes and towns have all been destroyed because of the hurricane, we will, or the cyclone, we will remember all of them this morning. Yeah, Sharla? Wonderful. Sharla's parents are here from Arkansas. Arkansas. Glad you're worshiping with us this morning. else that needs to be lifted up? Let's pray. Let's continue to pray. Gracious God, you, you hear our sharings. You hear our joys, our concerns. You hear our, our, our grief over losing people we love very much, moving to a new place and a new town. Thank you for walking with us through all of it. Thank you for being a God who, while not removing us from such situations, but rather one who empowers us in the midst of them, we, we ask that you would give us the strength we need, the hope, the encouragement. God, as we grieve the loss of a cousin, as we celebrate time with family, as we pray for a sister who's broken a foot and the challenges that that will bring to her life, we anticipate, perhaps with some anxiety, going to a new town, in a new community, finding a new church. God, thank you for being with us through it all. And whatever's going on in each of our lives, God, there are things happening that, that have not been lifted up this morning, things that we only know and no one else is aware of. Meet us where we are. Strengthen us, equip us, and give us peace. We thank you for the hope 
that we know because of Christ. And ask that you hear us now as we together pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Please stand now for our closing hymn. Friends, as you go forth from this place, hope loud, dream big, and dare to imagine. 
And may the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Spirit fill you and surround you today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen.